Well, hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you as ever from Vitality Stadium. Our job here is to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the club throughout the course of the season, be it first team players, staff or key academy personnel. Now, for those of you who are new to our podcast, my name is Zoe Rundle and I'm part of the media team here at AFC Bournemouth. As ever, I'm of course joined by my colleague Neil Perrett, who has been covering the Cherries for 30 years. He's quite literally seen it all and is an absolute encyclopedia of knowledge. Now, Neil, we've got a special podcast to celebrate International Women's Day today. And I know you're very excited to be sat here in the company of two women. Very, very excited, Zoe. I think the phrase, a rose between two thorns, springs to mind, if you don't mind me saying that. No, really excited to be here. As you say, International Women's Day on uh, today. Um, been covering a lot of the women, the women's team with you this season uh, and in the last few seasons, and they're doing really, really well. So it's fitting that we've got somebody from that department with us today. Absolutely. It's a, a really exciting guest that we've got today and I have no doubt that we'll have a lot of laughs over the course of the next hour. Now, she became a Cherries player in the summer and hasn't looked back since, fully immersing herself in AFC Bournemouth both on and off the pitch. So without further ado, we're delighted to welcome Becky Bath onto the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Becky, it's great to see you. It's great to have you here. How are things and how much are you looking forward to speaking with us today? Oh, it's great to be here, guys. Um, thanks for having me on the podcast. Um, yeah, looking forward to giving everyone a little bit of an insight about me and my life inside and outside of football. And I hope everyone enjoys it. Got a lot to get through. I know that uh, you've got lots of experiences in the game so far. Let's let's go right back to the start, Becky. Tell us how you got involved in football and just tell us about your early experiences. Well, it was a bit of a... I didn't expect to be involved in football, to be honest with you. Um, I was actually a dancer and I danced five times a week um ballet tap modern jazz you name it i did it um and for some reason my primary school set up a girls football team and i thought i'll give it a go and apparently i was all right so here i am so you gave up dancing to be a f to, yeah, to yeah, yeah. so i did try and do both at, at the same time um and I was just playing for like a local academy. It was just called Ferrum Academy on a Friday evening, um, which actually clashed with, I think it was the modern, the modern dance class. So I had to give up the modern dance class, which was fine because I could carry on everything else. And then football just took over my life. So I gave up all dancing and went straight into football. A bit of a ballerina on the pitch these days? No, God, no. <laughs> my flexibility is shocking. You'd never believe it, honestly. You'd never believe it. Actually saying that, I will say, um, the last few weeks, my uh, my mum was very good at dancing and she wanted to start up ballet again. So she said to me, will you come to a few sessions with me? So I have been doing that on a Thursday evening. I've been doing some ballet sessions. Now, when I was young, younger, you said your primary school started a football team. I certainly had to join in with all the boys if I wanted to play football because no girls ever played football. Was that ever the case for you? Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, even on the playground, it was, you know, a boys' game. Um, I think there might have been one or two, including myself, girls who wanted to play football. And you had to work your way up. You had to show that you were good, you know. Um, you couldn't just go... St it, normally it was, you know, you had two captains and they'd, they'd, they'd pick the teams. And it was always the two girls last, always me and, the, and another girl that I went to school with who was last. And um, in the end, I think I was at least second. I was getting picked second, so... I had to, yeah, had to work my way up. Did you ever have any sort of brothers or sisters that you played with or kicked the ball around with in your garden or whatever? Yeah, so um, I have a few. I have quite a lot of brothers and sisters, actually, to be honest with you. Um, so I have two older sisters and an older brother from my dad's previous relationship. And I have um, a sister and a brother from both my parents together. And um, we used to when my older brother used to come round on the weekends we used to go and play football all the time um and then me and my little brother yeah we we really bonded actually I it was really good that we both liked football because we used to play together all the time even if we got new we were talking about it last night actually if we got new football boots for christmas whatever we'd be straight over the park playing football and uh, my brother was saying i didn't actually remember this until last night he said where he was younger than me and his feet were smaller than mine I used to always get the real predators and he used to get the fake ones and we used to argue about it all the time. I remember my dad coming up to me saying, 
Beck, just pretend that yours are fake too. And I used to, have to say, yeah, mine are fake as well. But yeah, so we all played. And, my, and even my young sister, she's always been a dancer, but she used to, we played for Wars Ash Wasps on a Sunday. And she used to play with us. She was our striker. She was class. So yeah, I guess football's always been a bit in the family. Do they ever come and watch you now? You know, your brothers and sisters yeah, and stuff like that? Yeah, all the time, yeah. Um, my brother my brother plays at a good level on a Sunday. So he's our games clash. He never comes. But yeah, my sister comes. My older brother and sisters come. Yeah, they will come as, as much as they can. You know, life's busy, isn't it? But yeah, any event they'll come to. And just tell us about your relationship with your dad. Like you seem from conversations we've had in the past, have a, a strong relationship with him. Yeah, he's he's great. Bless him. I mean, both my parents, like they're honestly the apple of my eye. But my dad, yeah, he he's very dedicated to my football. Um, supported me throughout regardless, no matter who I was playing for. If it, I can remember I had a year break because I didn't know who I wanted to play for and he supported me then as well. And yeah, tra- traveling up and down to Chelsea three times, four times a week. Yeah, he's, he's always had my back regardless. Do you think, is he living maybe a football career in you that he didn't have or did he have? I don't know. Yeah, so my dad was... Yeah, my dad was a really good footballer. And, he, you know, you walk down the street in Fairham, Portsmouth, Southampton, wherever, and and he'll know someone. He was very well known. Um, played at Pompey, or tried for Pompey, I can't remember which one. But, yeah, he he's playing a good good standard. Um, and I just don't think, I don't know what happened. He kind of just would rather go out socially, you know, play the football, score, win the game for them, but then looked forward to the pub after more than actually playing the football match, I guess. But yeah, I would say he's living, yeah, none of his sons made it. So I guess I had to do something. <laughs> now, things started getting serious in your football career. Was it Chelsea and Haven't and Waterloo? You had a decision to make there? Yeah, so um, I was at Chelsea Academy uh, from under 12s, under 12s to, well, yeah, reserves really. And um, yeah. It got to the, the point where I was 17. I was choosing which college I wanted to go to. There was an option at Chelsea. There was an option at South Downs, which is in Portsmouth. And then the football team alongside that was having a Waterlooville. And I mean, both of the like uh, college programmes were the same. So you w- I wasn't going to get anything out college-wise. It was just would have been the football. Um, but I just couldn't imagine myself living away from my, like my mum and dad. I just, yeah, I love them. So I just want, I'm a bit of a home bird. I just wanted to be at home with them, really. So I chose Haven't. So you left Chelsea to join Haven't and Waterlooville. Yeah. People must be thinking, you must be mad. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it, I, did, you I, re- did you regret that decision at all? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I do and I don't. I look back and I think I probably could, with you know the right, I'm not saying that I haven't had the right coaching, but maybe more, The Chelsea obviously had more support and, and a lot more around them than Haven't and Waterlooville did. So I think maybe in that sense, I probably could have gone a lot further than, than I did at that age. Um, but at the time, I loved it. I loved the college and I didn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have looked back at that time and thought, oh, I've made the wrong, the wrong choice. But yeah, I think now maybe I think or, but I try not to think about it. I live for the moment. I try not to think about or dwell on the past. So Now, Pompey girl, born and bred end up playing for Southampton I, I understand um, yeah. now you're grimacing there we can't see that yeah. of course, but <laughs> we can see it but people listening can't you're grimacing what was it like playing for Southampton um I tried not to think about the fact that I was playing for a team that I actually d- detest and still to this day dislike <laughs> but I enjoyed it I loved the girls there and the coaching was great. And at the time, the club was going in the right direction and we were top of like, we were top of the league Bournemouth are in now, um, by far. But there was no backing from the men's team then. Um, But yeah, I I did love it. But I was made to promise my dad that I wouldn't let the badge touch me, my skin. (laughs) I had to wear a t-shirt underneath my shirt so the badge didn't touch my to touch my skin so yes. what, what was that like in pre-season when it's like 80 degrees or something like that do you know what actually and this is God's honest truth I didn't wear a Saints t-shirt in pre-season I wore my own Adidas or Nike t-shirt because I couldn't face it <laughs> <laughs> believe it or not but yeah that's that's yeah I mean I don't think my dad would have said you know you're not playing for them or you're not doing it but I did say to him you know I won't let the badge touch me 
Well, there we and go. That must have been a, a deciding factor for him. But after then, you then go and play for Pompey. As a Pompey girl, that must have been a dream come true. Absolutely. Um, the, the reason why I didn't play for Pompey beforehand is because um, I I don't think they were doing as, as well or they weren't, to, to me, they weren't a big team. You know, my, my I lived in, I didn't live in Southampton, I lived in Locks Heath, which is just in between Portsmouth and Southampton. Um, and Southampton was actually closer to me. And Portsmouth, they weren't like a massive team back then. So I would never would have thought, oh, I really want to play for Portsmouth. But then I think I went to Moneyfields for a season and, and I thought, you know, I, I'm just not, this isn't me. And I thought I'm going, going to Pompey. And yeah, and it was just unreal. Even now, like I look back and I think best decision I've made, definitely going to Pompey. You grew up watching Pompey in the Premier League, the, the golden years. Just give us your memories of that. Oh, it was amazing. I just, I, the thing that I remember the most is after every single home game, I used to stand outside Fratton Park with a book and wait for all the players to go to their cars and get their autographs. And that is, honestly, I remember that more than I remember anything. I remember the, the loudness of Fratton Park and the buzz I used to get. And yeah, it's just, oh, it's just so amazing. I mean, I feel lucky to have been brought up supporting Portsmouth because, yeah, I don't think there's a better buzz than Fratton Park. Did that inspire you to want to be a footballer as well, watching those players? Um, what era was that you were watching as well? Just tell us. Um, 2000, well, wow, right from, prob well, yeah, probably about 2004 onwards. Maybe even a little bit earlier, to be fair with you. Um, but yeah, it did, it did inspire me. It did. But I didn't actually think I'm going to go out and make somewhat of a career out of football when I was watching them because I lived for, for Portsmouth Football Club and the men that played there and and the buzziness of Fratton Park. I didn't think I'm going to go and do that. Although you did used to obviously, you know, when you're a kid and you set up a free kick and you're like, the wah, la wah. Like I used to think I was like all these players when I was a girl, but yeah. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, I guess it did, it did and it didn't. I think my dad inspired me more than anything. We know our technical director, Richard Hughes, was one of your favourite players. You also like Matty Taylor. Oh, I, I did love Matty Taylor, yeah. Matty Taylor and Todorov. I like Todorov. But I think that's because he was so involved in when I used to go and get the, the autographs. He used to really make an effort with us kids. And yeah, he was lovely. The Wa Wa. I, I, do you know what? There's, I probably don't have an overly favourite player. I loved them all, honestly. I loved them all. Even Shaka Hislop. I loved him. Now, Zoe was once Gary O'Neill's mascot at Portsmouth, our coach here. Did you ever manage to become a mascot for anybody at Fratton Park or try or fail or...? Um, I didn't. And do you know what? I don't know why. It never appealed to... I never thought I really want to be a mascot. I don't know why. I don't know. But no, I didn't. So I just used to love being in the thick of it, you know, getting all involved in the stands. Now, in an interview, you said... Leaving Portsmouth for Bournemouth was the biggest decision of your life. Yeah, it was. It was definitely a very, if not the biggest decision of my football career. Um, for many reasons, really. I think um, the last season that I was at Portsmouth, I was probably at the height of my game. Um, I was top goal scorer of the league, or at least top goal scorer in Portsmouth Football Club. Um, and the relationships I had built with the girls is pr even now I, you, I love the girls at Bournemouth, but I just had connection with a few of them. And to be able to play with your best mates on a pitch is it, honestly it brings out the best in you. Um, and things didn't really go as planned, and I knew I had to get out. And yeah, I had to make that decision. As my, you know, my heart was still Portsmouth and always will be, but my head just wasn't in it, and I knew that I wasn't going to get a good season if I stayed there, so on to bigger and better, really. Would you change anything about that decision or not? No, definitely not. Definitely not. I think no matter what you do in life, you kind of, if you go from one big thing that you really love, but don't have much of a choice in, I don't know, staying there or committing to that, um, I think it's always at the beginning, you're like, oh, did I make the right decision? But yeah, now, no, wouldn't even, I would never look back. Love Pompey, but... Love Bournemouth more. So 
the acid test and the really big question of this podcast, is it true that you are now looking for Bournemouth's results ahead of Portsmouth's results? And be honest. Honestly, yes. <laughs> I am. But I guess it's because I'm so passionate about football and I love playing. So, and I'm playing for a team that I love and I'm, I, I enjoy it. I probably am I'm, I'm enjoying it more than I have, than I can remember actually. So I just want the men's team to do well too. I don't know whether that's become because or come from when I played for my club that I supported all my life. I don't know. Maybe it's just a bit of a commitment thing, you know. Now for you, you're not just playing for AFC Bournemouth, you're also working for the club as a member of staff of the Community Sports Trust. Just tell us a bit more about your role and your involvement there. Yeah, so... Um, that, that, I mean, it was a big reason why I came to the football club as well, because I got offered the job as the targeted kicks um, officer, which is, um, it's basically, my job role is to um, provide a one-to-one -one mentoring service for young disadvantaged children through social work, through um, the youth justice system, and basically kind of get them off the streets maybe not physically off the streets, but kind of keep them out of trouble in the community by getting them involved in sport, normally football. For you, do you ever find it hard to stay cool, calm and collected? Because you must have to deal with some really challenging individuals. Yeah, um, I think it's in my nature, to be fair. I'm quite chilled. Um, but if someone pushes me that little bit too far, they'll know about it, I think. Um, but, you yeah, know... The majority of the time, I, I actually feel quite sorry for these young people. Um, and it's, you know, it stems back to their childhood or what they previously may have experienced or whatever. So I try not to, you know, look at them and think, it's, it's, this is you. Because obviously, some, most of the times it's triggered. Um, but no, I think I'm quite good at staying calm. Yeah. Now, we've got a little clip to play you next. We want you to have a listen and see if you can identify the singer. Now it's all right, it's okay. You may look the other way. We can try to understand the New York Times and fake time, man. Whether your brother or whether your mother is staying alive, staying alive. We'll see the great and everybody shaking and staying alive, staying alive. So just for the benefit of our listeners, that song was made by the AFC Bournemouth squad in 1998 to celebrate reaching the final of the Auto Windscreen Shield, which was played at Wembley. It's the first time the club had ever played at Wembley. I know that you were only five or six or whatever, but a very great player in our history led us out that day at Wembley. My wife made me play that clip because she said it's the, it's the worst and flattest singing that she's ever heard in her life. So have you got any ideas who it was? Yeah. I do. <laughs> it was Ian, wasn't it? Who was who? <laughs> Ian Cox. Oh my God, I can imagine him singing like that as well. <laughs> now, oh, that's jokes. the reason we've picked that clip out is, of course, you said that you work with the AFC Bournemouth Community Sports Trust and you work alongside Ian Cox. Just tell us about working alongside him. I do, and I say it every single day. Ian saves my day every day. He saves me. He covers my backside more than you'll ever imagine honestly no he's a great guy that's i don't have a bad word to say about ian i just i just think this, i just think he's a legend absolute legend um he yeah he just helps me he just keeps me cool calm and collective every day just talking about his um life experiences in his job because he's doing a similar job to you i know we talk about his football career playing in the world cup this that and the other but He's worked in some really, really challenging environments. He's told me about that. He's told us on, on his podcast that he did a few months ago. Um, and you you must be learning from him about how to deal with all those situations Absolutely, as well. yeah, absolutely. Um, any questions, queries I have about uh, any young people, the first person I pick up the phone to ring is Ian. He, his experience and, and how he knows how to deal with things, any situation I find myself in, Ian knows how to, how to help me. 
he's just a book of knowledge that guy and he's just so chilled like i don't know how he gets through his day because he's just so relaxed he's got no worry well he comes across he's got no worries um and he just yeah he's just oh he's just a great guy i literally know everything about him actually (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's the next question. Do you what do you know about him? What about his footballing career? Can you So obviously know that he uh, played in the World Cup um for Trinidad and Tobago. I listened to his podcast though to be fair, so I did get a lot out of it. He finished playing at 38 cuz he had a niggle um in his uh hamstring or quad, I can't remember which one actually to be fair. Um and he just couldn't shake it. Um I mean, what do you want to know? I know loads. Just tell us so when you report for work on Monday morning, you've played on Sundays. He's obviously watched us or, or done whatever. Do, do you talk to him football? You know, or does he ask how you got on or yeah, anything like that? Yeah, every time. So if I, I normally see him in the office on a Monday and the first thing we'll talk about is football. How did you get on? Oh, I mean, normally he knows the score because I guess he keeps tabs, but we have to talk about it. We'll talk about what went right, what went wrong, how many goals we scored. You know, we talk about everything. Um, and to be honest with you, he doesn't really relate it to himself ever. It's just all about you know my game and then I'll ask questions about oh what did you do in this situation or you know how did you deal with this and yeah he'll uh, he'll help me this season we beat Southampton 4-0 at home and a certain fan on the sidelines bet you 50 pound that you couldn't hit the top corner when you were stood over a free kick from 40 yards out tell us about that story and tell us what happened next um well first things first I have never seen the 50 pound so <laughs> still waiting for that um but um <laughs> basically what happened was he i don't know he was stood behind me and we'd got the free kick so i put the ball and i thought you know it's on the on the right side and i'd be able to kind of whip it in with my left foot and then he said oh I bet you can't score and i went oh don't bet me that and i was just having a little bit of a laugh of him and he said well bet you 50 quid you can't get it top bins then and i said all right then and I, I thought, I, I looked at the ball and I thought, I could do this. So I did it. I just wellied it, really. And it lobbed the keeper. And then I said to him, I'll have that 50 quid then. And he just thought, was like looking at me like I was mad or something. And then afterwards, he came up to me and he said, I will give you that 50 pound to, when I come to a game next time. And I've never seen him since. But he followed me on Instagram and then messaged me saying, I won't ever forget that I owe you £50 or something like that. Well, let's hope that he's coming to a game very soon or listening to the AFC Bournemouth podcast because Becky Bath has not forgotten about that £50 that she is owed. <laughs> um, now, because of that goal, you held off strong competition from Dominic Slanky and Jane Anthony to win the Strategic Solutions Goal of the Month Award for August. Was it the best goal of your career? Yeah. Yeah, one of, yeah, definitely. Um... Probably the best goal I can remember, um, but yeah, it was it was pretty all right. It was the right goal, wasn't it? How nice was that for you? You know, it's a club-wide competition. We've got first team players being nominated. We've got Academy 18s and, and you win the award that's voted for by the fans. Yeah, um, I was so thankful for everyone who voted for points of view and I still, to this day, can't believe it. I'm still like, well, I don't know how I did that. Um, but yeah, I was really, yeah. I was buzzing to be fair with you. It's probably the best award that I've won, especially against the men's team. Like I think women, the women's game and the men's game get completely separated at times. But when you beat a man, a professional footballer who plays and trains every day and you get voted by the members of the public to be to score a better goal than them. Yeah, I don't think I still don't think it's, it's really settled in my mind that it's happened is it true that you voted for dom slanky i did yeah i did only because only because i wanted to see who was winning (laughs) so you didn't vote for yourself because i was too worried that you'd be able to see who i voted for and think god how big headed (laughs) is she (laughs) we certainly wouldn't have blamed you how refreshing becky is it that the club involves the women the under 18s the under 23s in the goal of the month and the goal of the season, it's easy to just pick four first team players and let everybody vote for them. Yeah, it is really refreshing. Um, I mean, it's a great opportunity to get exposure for the women's game. Completely, like, yeah. And not many clubs do that, you know. I think a lot of clubs are kind of focused on 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 their first team, which is understandable. You know, they get a lot of uh, a lot of following, and yeah, 
a lot of coverage and stuff. So yeah, it's just, yeah, it's really refreshing. And the women actually really appreciate it. They really do appreciate it. Now they say lightning doesn't strike twice, Becky, but it did in your case because two weeks after you'd scored that 40 yarder, you scored another 40 yarder against Paul Town. Is it that your teammates are saying, why don't you just shoot, Becky? You never, are you ever going to pass to me? No, no. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I scored that again, to be honest with you. I, in the moment, I don't really think about doing it. I just looked up, saw the keeper off a line and thought, I'll give it a go. Um, I wouldn't say playing against Paul Town was our best game at all. And we had to take the opportunity to score when we could. And that was an opportunity. So I just went for it. And is it true that you are the encyclopedia in the changing room? You know about all the league tables, the stats, you know, who's playing who, this, that and the other. If anybody wants to know anything, they turn to you. Uh, yeah, that's me. Um, it's, I think it's because I look at the league every Sunday night and I look at who's played who and who's got who and points, goal difference and, yeah, basically what we need to get to get to the top. That's what I look for. I was going to say, why Why do you do that? Is it something you've always done or is it something you've started now? You're getting really excited about this season. Um, to be fair, I've, I, I have always looked at the league and where we are and how many points we've got, no matter what team I've been at. But I think the excitement's really taken over and sometimes I do have to, like, you know, reel myself in because I get so, like, you know, next season when we get promoted. And I'm like, we, we're not, we haven't even got promoted. We've still got, like, six, seven games to play yet. So, Becky, we're recording this podcast between you having played Maidenhead on Sunday and drawn nil-nil, and now you've got to play them this coming Sunday as well. So just tell us where you are in the league at the moment and what the promotion picture is, how it works, how many go up and where you go to. OK, so we're in Tier 4 at the moment, which is the National League. And if we get promoted, we go up to Tier 3 of the National League. Um, and so at the moment, currently, as it stands, we're sat second point behind top with top to play so we could be sitting first two points clear when we play Cheltenham in two Sundays time as now yeah we we're currently sitting second we could go top on Sunday because Cheltenham have a, uh, a cup game so we'll then be one game in hand sit in top spot if we win because you're such an encyclopedia of knowledge, we are going to test that knowledge, of course. So we've got three more questions that we're just going to chuck at you. Um, the first one is a personal stat. How many goals have you scored this season? Well, what, in cup and league or just league? In cup and league. Um, 12. Mm, you're doing yourself a disservice. You scored 13. 13. Oh. oh, sorry. Yeah, 13. Sorry. Yeah, I did notice 13. 13. Lucky number 13. How many points are we currently on? We are currently on 31. 31, absolutely. 31 points indeed. Now, this is obviously, again, ahead of the Maidenhead game at home this weekend. Um, final question. I'd be interested to know if you do know this. You can probably take an educated guess if you don't. Now, who has started the most games for us this season? Katie James. No, incorrect. I'll be honest with you, you were second. I was second. You were second, yeah. No. Yeah. You might have been joint second, but you were second. Bambi. Bambi. I yeah, I do see that. I don't know why I didn't think about the wing, the fullbacks for some reason. <laughs> now, for those who don't know, Bambi is Emma Davis. Everyone calls her Bambi. Why yeah. do Why do everyone Why does everyone call her Bambi? Um, I actually did find this out because I asked the same question. So she was at a training session once, and her legs were going all over the place like Bambi on ice. So someone just called her Bambi, and I guess it stuck. I didn't even know her name was Emma. Someone called Emma was writing in the WhatsApp group and I was, oh, I don't know an Emma. There's not an Emma that plays for us. And I was, yeah, but it was, it was Bambi. So just tell us earlier this season, a quirk of fate, you got drawn against Portsmouth in yes. the FA Women's Cup. What, what was that like? What were your emotions when the draw came through, first of all? Oh my, I was buzzing. I was so excited to play them. Only because I guess I know the team. I know the manager. I know how they play. I know what their goals are. I know the team inside out. And then on the day, I have never experienced nerves like that at a football match. I'm quite good at like just doing some briefing techniques. At half time, wow. I think we were two one down and we were on top and I was just shaking and I couldn't stop shaking. And I said to, um, it, was, it was either KJ or Jade Bradley and I said, I'm shaking, I can't stop shaking. They were like, just relax. 
but yeah, it was a, it was such a surreal feeling. But yeah, it was amazing to play against them. And it was lovely to see all the fans and stuff as well. And the result didn't go our way, but it must have been quite an emotional day for you personally and, and a few other ex-Pompey girls in our team. Yeah, definitely. To be honest with you, I think the, the, the way we played was probably even still now the best we've played. Um, whether it's because we kind of matched the level of the opposition, I don't know. But yeah, although the score line didn't go our way, I felt like we won. That was the first time I felt like we'd gelled together as a team, worked hard for each other, wanted to, to succeed. We wanted, yeah, we wanted it. But we should, have, we should have scored about four or five. I watched it back after and I thought, why didn't we put that away? Why didn't I make that run? Why didn't I do this? But yeah, it was unreal. You said that coming here was a huge decision in your footballing career. Just for people who don't know, explain the women's set up here and just tell us your view on it the women's set up here is i mean even well from an outsider it was good it was i thought oh god that's you know bournemouth are going in the right direction but now i'm in it it's probably the best backing that i've I, we've had uh we oh, i've had sorry um since playing football um the support the you know being in with like the men having the chance to play in the ground we can come to the stadium we get to be involved with the media we you know we get kit we get everything a woman's team could really want. Um, yeah, it's it's, un, it's unreal. And like I said to you, it's, you know, sometimes I'm driving home and I think, wow, like I still can't believe like we got all this like backing and stuff. Yeah, it's quite surreal, but honestly, every single girl on that team appreciates it. One of my previous experiences of working in the local, working for the local newspaper was when women's football was trying to get off the ground. It was... It was hard work for women's football. It was a slow process, but there's no question in the last few years, it's it's just gone through the roof. Absolutely. Um, for, when I was at, at Chelsea, there was no no funding or whatsoever. And that was probably one of the decisions, uh, one of the reasons why it made me ha like, helped with my decision was because my dad actually said to me, I'm taking you up there four times a week now and it's cost, you know, petrol's going up and it's costing a bomb. Um, so yeah when you were sort of starting out did you ever envisage it would be as big as it is now and, and it's only going to get bigger um i did no i didn't but i look at i look back and i do like things like you know the world cup was for the women's was like televised that was a big step when i watched them on tv um but there's so much more to come like so much more to come we know it will never be as big as the men's game we know that but yeah there's so much more to come and and like the next generation after me I, they're going to be laughing like every young girl that I see you playing I'm like continue for like following your dreams because there's more to come like you're going to get a lot out of out of football just for the benefit of people listening in it's not just the first team here just tell us about the next generation coming through and tell yeah. us what's below you here okay so we have Obviously, we have the women's first team, then we have the reserves, who we we work quite closely with. We train with, not with them, but they train next to us at the same time. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, young girls from the reserve team coming up and making um, their debuts into the first team um, from the reserves. And they're, they're really good. And then we've obviously got uh, under six, um, is it under 10s to under 16s? And honestly I've never seen little ballers like it they are they are class so we get to train them when they're just finishing and sometimes I just find myself just like walking past them looking at them thinking there was no way I was that good as a kid and they're like shooting from the halfway line or like doing step overs and taking the ball around other you know their teammates and I just think you've well you're going to make it like you it's going to be big for you for you, you've been fortunate enough to play with your partner Jade at Portsmouth and now here at AFC Bournemouth. How nice is that for you, you know, going to games together, training together? Yeah, it's, it is lovely. Um, at, at first we were like, you know, this isn't going to, we aren't going to, football and home life separate, we're not going to do anything together. Like we wouldn't, we wouldn't, when we first got together, we wouldn't even travel to training together or anything like that because <laughs> we just wanted it separate. Then it got to the point, I was like, we're both wasting petrol. Why don't we just go together? But yeah, um, it's great. It really is great. It's nice to have the support as well. Like when you get home and say, you know, I'm, I'm on my own back all the time. I'm like, oh, I'm just, yeah. And if I go home and think I've had a, a rubbish game, 
you know she's always that kind of no you didn't you did this you did this and then I'm kind of fine um but then on the other hand you know it can get a bit like there's sometimes on the pitch I'm like just shut up but yeah it is it's, it is good yeah I'm very lucky one of my questions was going to be do you find yourself talking much about matches or training at home or on the way home it clearly is a big part of your life the issue is I don't find myself talking about anything else <laughs> it's just football you know it might be like oh do you have a nice day yeah because she's obviously working for Bournemouth as well um yeah did you yeah how did you find training <laughs> oh god here we go <laughs> but yeah we uh talk about football all the time that's all we talk about but I guess it's great it is good like it's yeah it's good tell us about being vegan is something quite recent to you yes so <laughs> I was vegetarian for years the reason being I went to Bali and they were I don't know I just when I was like driving around the island on my little moped that I hired out whenever I stopped at traffic lights for some reason there was chickens in cages next to me and I just was like I can't eat chicken over here like I can't and I was there for like a month so I didn't have chicken for a month or any other meat so I come home and I was like oh do you know what I don't need it. I felt really good. I was like, oh, I feel really like energized or whatever. Sounds so stupid. And then that was like three, four years ago. And then I started slowly not eating eggs, but just because I'd gone off them. I didn't, there wasn't no reason. And then it was like fish. I didn't eat fish. We went to uh, away over Christmas and I didn't have any sort of fish when I was away. Um, and then I, yeah. And then I just stopped drinking milk in my tea because I'd always have black coffee. And then here I am, vegan, three weeks in. And you're keeping it up? Yeah, I am, yeah. It's, um, people will think, shut up, don't be so stupid. But honestly, I'm bench pressing heavier than I've ever bench pressed. And it's all to be a vegan, I promise you. It's, this is quite topical at the moment because I don't know if you've seen, but um, Mark Pugh, who used to play for the club in the Premier League era, has recently... Well, not recently, but he's like the foodie footballer now. He coaches yeah, yeah, I've seen that, yeah. nutrition and, and stuff like that. How have you found the vegan diet, if you like, uh, impacting on your playing? Honestly, I feel so energetic. Honestly, I, I'm not even joking. I'm not just saying I'm not being a preachy vegan because I'm not at all. I'm just doing it for myself. But honestly, I am so energetic. I sleep better for some reason. And when I'm like training or in the gym... I can do, I feel like I'm doing more than what I've ever done. So I guess, yeah, it's given me a bit of energy boost. You've spoken already about how much the club has backed the women's team. Now, that backing has now extended to a first competitive game here on the pitch at Vitality Stadium and an opportunity for the women's team and everyone in it to, to make some history. Absolutely. Um, what an opportunity. And what a stadium, by the way. Like, no better stadium to kind of be able to play at um yeah it's a great opportunity and again a great like um way to get the public down to watch the women's team get the women some exposure but yeah i'm 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 really looking for i am really looking forward to it but i'm really trying to focus on this maidenhead and cheltenham game before i think about it's almost going to be like a treat to us you know you've, we at that point hopefully we would be two points clear at the top maybe more and our little treat will be go and enjoy the stadium so yeah we're, bu we're buzzing but congratulations for not using the uh, stereotypical we're taking one game as it comes football cliche there were you tempted no <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I'm going to put you on the on the soapbox now I'm going to you, you've got a message to our supporters about this game in April you want to see them here. You want to see, I would say, pack the stadium. You want to see them, you know, turn out in their numbers. As many as as many as can possibly come down and watch the women's game. It would be great um, to see, and also it would be it would be great for the the girls playing to inspire the younger girls. That's a big thing for me at the moment. Um, they love it. They love to watch what they could potentially be. And like I said, they're going to get a lot more out of it than what we do right now. Um, yeah, so as many people as possible to get behind us. Hopefully we can give you a, a good performance. Put on a show for you all. Just going to ask uh, Zoe just to confirm the date, the opposition, the kickoff time of that game, Zoe. Yes, Sunday 10th of April. Put it all in your calendars. Two o'clock in the afternoon. 
we're going to uh, we're going to pack the stadium out hopefully with as many people as possible it'd be great to see you down here all the fans if you're thinking about it 100 percent, come down see what you're missing it's going to be really exciting you know there's going to be lots going on in and around the game and yeah it's going to be it's going to be historic either way so it's going to be going to be brilliant so Becky, we're gonna we're gonna finish off with some questions from supporters have submitted some questions. We're gonna reel them off. Benjamin wants to know who is your footballing icon? Oh, Lionel Messi. Definitely. Whether it's because he's got a left foot and I have two, I don't know. But he was just his work rate, he's just the goat, isn't he? He really is the goat of football. Um and also I've watched him play from a younger age, so when I was younger, yeah. And, and a woman's footballing icon? Do you know, it was Kelly Smith. It was Kelly Smith, but I don't know whether that was because she was the biggest women's footballer and she was kind of the most exposed back then. But yeah, it was Kelly Smith. I wanted to be play like her, definitely. Tasha is asking, what advice would you give to a young girl just starting out in a women's team? Don't stop ever. <laughs> if that's what if you want to play football and you enjoy playing football, don't put too much pressure on yourself. Enjoy every single game and work really hard to be the best you can be. Now James wants to know, do you have any rituals before a game or perhaps any superstitions at all? Um just what I consume, food wise. Um it's always on a Sunday, uh yogurt with granola and fruit in the morning. Maybe a rice cake if I treat it myself. And then a bowl of porridge beforehand. And again, some energy gels or whatever before the game. But that's, if I don't have that, just, I just don't think that I would. If I made a mistake, I'd blame that. Put it that way. Sammy is asking, who is Becky Bath outside of football? What sort of hobbies do you have and that sort of thing? Um, I mean, my hobbies are football. That's <laughs> it. If I'm not playing football, I'm talking about it. Or... I love spending time with my family. That is the best thing. Um, my little nephew, got two little nephews and they're just, oh, I just love them so much. Um, my mum loves spending time with my mum. We just laugh. That's all we do when we're together. So just spending time with family um, and friends. Yeah. Walking the dog? Oh, walking the dog. Walking the dog in this weather is a chore at the moment, a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I love spending time with the dog. Um, yeah, I miss her when I'm not with her. It's really stupid, but she's just a dog. But she's, yeah, she's my baby. Now, final question has come from a certain Katie Scadding. <laughs> I've seen that eye roll. Now, for those who don't know, Katie Scadding is a goalkeeper for the AFC Bournemouth women's team. She wants to know who is the funniest in the squad? Funniest in the squad? I'm not going to answer that because I don't even want to give her a big head. <laughs> no, it's her. She is actually funny. <laughs> she actually is funny. <laughs> well, there we go. Katie, you got the answer that you wanted to hear. Now, Becky, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here with us. We've absolutely loved your company and your fascinating stories. We're really looking forward to seeing what you girls can achieve for the remainder of the season. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Now, if you have enjoyed listening to our podcast, we'd absolutely love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you are listening on. We'd also be very grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans, whether they're AFC Bournemouth fans or not, can enjoy it as well. Our thanks again to Becky Bath and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle. Thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. <laughs>